Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord.
from the first letter of Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled in the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting upon you. Humble yourself to God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. Those brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish him and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen.
Gospel of the Lord. The, uh, his 75-year plan. It's broken up into five-year increments and has subpoints and points under that. And it's meant to be a plan for the rest of their life. Now, of course, the comedy and drama of the movie is how all of that doesn't turn out pretty and doesn't doesn't turn out in a, in a very fast manner. But I love this scene because it's it's so real. We always want to try and plan out everything. We always want to have everything under control. We would love to have a 75-year plan. That if we just followed it to the letter, we'd be in a good place. Today's reading the, in, from Acts, the disciples have found that their 75-year plan has gone out the window. They have just seen Jesus come back from the dead. He's been resurrected. And they think, okay, we can get back to the business that we had been doing before that whole crucifixion hiccup. Let's get back to uh, restoring the kingdom of Israel. Because that's what you're going to do, Jesus. It is now the time when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They ask in verse 6. And just then, I think Jesus has a little bit of comedic timing here. He starts to ascend up into heaven, right when they think they can get on with the plan. You can see an image of this in our window uh, here to your left of the ascension, where you know Jesus is ascending and the disciples, they're reaching out their hands, and you can read this in a couple ways. They're, they might be saying, oh wow, this is so glorious. Jesus, you're ascending to the Father's right hand. Or they might be trying to grab him and get him back down. Or they might just be saying, where are, you, where are you going, Jesus? Stay here, hang out with us. we got work to do. What's going on? But before he ascends, he also charges them to bear witness to him. He charges them to go into Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. This again isn't part just going to restore Israel. We were supposed to kick the Romans out. We were supposed to restore right worship in the temple and have you on the throne, Jesus. And now you want us to go to the ends of the earth? You want us to go to Spain? What is going on here, Jesus? I think that this is real reality. We often have plans for ourselves. We often have plans for our futures. Get misdirected. Something happens, even if it's a good thing, and that causes anxiety. It can cause uncertainty. It can cause us to doubt. And that's where the disciples are today. I'm sure if you think about your own life, you can identify a place where this has happened, where you thought that everything land, and then that plan took a left turn. Maybe it was a death, a diagnosis, a new job offer, a new relationship, something that took your plan in a different direction. And even if that is a good thing, or if it was a bad thing, that can cause uncertainty, it can cause anxiety, and that is where the disciples are. And that's where we 
We'll find ourselves there many times. Probably already have been there a few, and they will continue. I think in the life of the church, both in St. Andrews and also the broader church, we are at one of those places. We're in a time of transition. We're in a time where we are anticipating our discernment and search, and we don't know what that will look like, and often we don't know what it's going to look like in between. That's probably not the plan that we thought was in place six months ago, five years ago, or maybe even sooner than that. In the broader church, we're looking at a narrative of decline. We're looking at a, at a loss of cultural relevance. We're looking at people saying that the church is hypocritical and often rightfully so. That too places us at crossroads. We look, we have faith in Christ, that Christ will protect the church, will lead us into faithfulness, but often when we look down at the statistics, just at those numbers about what the Pew research says, we don't know how to go forward. How are we supposed to be disciples in a world where the church needs to really work in order to make this? in a world in which the church really needs to spread the good news in order to show people Christ, in which attendance at church can't even be a, a, a cultural given anymore. How do we live into that reality? How do we live into that faithfulness? All that is to say that personally, communally, ecclesially, we will face changes in our plans, changes in what we think will happen. We can plan out our 75-year plans, but something is going to take them in a different direction. So how do we go on? How do we go on in faith? How do we take up Christ's command to be bear witnesses to him in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, in our own lives, and in the church? So here's the odd thing about the ascension. Christ departs, we can see him leaving right there, but he departs in order to, in an odd way, be even more present with us. He is going away in the way that we, we would expect him to be present, but he, in so doing, he becomes present to us in a more fundamental way, in a different way. The disciples, they expect Jesus to, to be present with them like Another person would be to just be right next to them and so that they could ask him, hey, Jesus, what should we do? Go do that. Okay, sounds good. But that's not what he's doing. He ascends to the Father's right hand. He goes to be with God. And I think that is a different kind of presence. Jesus is absent in one way, but he becomes present to the disciples in another way. So we confess in our creed, he is at me. Luke, the author of Acts, he uh, describes the ascension in terms of Jesus going up to be at the Father's right hand. I think uh, maybe a more helpful way for us to think about it is that just that Jesus is going to be with God. A human being, Jesus, is with God and is with God for us. Now, as we heard last week, God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. God is everywhere, all the time, at once. Jesus is at the Father's right hand, and thus can be present to us everywhere. He ascends to the Father's right hand in order to rule all things, govern all things, to intercede for us in God's presence. So Jesus leaves the disciples. He goes away from them in one way, but that's so that he can be with God for them and for them with God. We know that we have an advocate with God because Christ is there. We know that uh, the one who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who preached justice, who 
proclaimed forgiveness to sinners is the very one who intercedes for you, for me. It's that man who rules all things, not Caesar, not the president, not whoever you can fill in that blank. And that's good news. So the disciples, they are anxious. They don't know what is next. They don't know how to go on, but they know that they have a Lord who will not leave them comfortless, as we heard in our opening collect. They know that they have a God who ascends in order to fill all things, as the Ascension Day of the says. So Christ ascends, he goes away, but in so doing is more present with them, is God for them in a different way. And so the disciples, they go from that place and they go immediately to the upper room. They go to that upper room where they shared that last supper, where they shared that first Eucharist with Christ, and they pray. They pray with Mary, they pray with other women who have been following Jesus and supporting his ministry all along this way, this, this inner circle. They pray for what's next. We'll get to that next week when we have the outpouring of the Spirit, but they pray and discern about where God is where Christ is leading them in this moment of unclarity, this moment of uncertainty. And this is a good model for us, because if Christ is with God, if God is in all things, then we can truly approach God wherever we are, with whoever is with us. And a, a mentor of mine, um, the Reverend Kara Slade, who would talk about how in seminary she didn't have the best prayer life, it's actually a common story. And uh, a friend of hers sat her down and said, hey, you know, if you had a friendship or a relationship and you never made time to expect that relationship to be, probably wouldn't be the most healthy one. If you had a friend that you never called or a spouse that you never communicated with, then things probably wouldn't be as healthy as they could be. And it's the same with our relationship with God. God is always with us and present to us, but sometimes we need, to, we need to put away distractions and tune into God's presence. We need to pray. We need to listen. We need to discern. We need to the promise of God's faithfulness, of God's joy, of God's purpose and plan for us. And that's exactly what the disciples are doing here. And it can be hard, but that's something that I think we should do anytime we are faced with uncertainty, faced with these difficult times. And I, speaking from personal experience, I know it is hard to do that when we are in those crisis situations. Because we want to deal with the change in the plan. We want to get back to that 75-year plan. We want to make sure that things are going the right way. Way. And we think, I can't take time away to pray, to, to be silent, to sit, to just receive during this time. But that's exactly where God meets us, is in those moments. And you notice the disciples, they don't know what to do after the ascension. They don't know what's next. They, Jesus did tell them to go and bear witness to him to the ends of the earth. But it's not until after they've spent that time in prayer and discernment that the Spirit is poured upon them at Pentecost. That they're called out to the ends of the earth by the power of that same Spirit that rested on Christ. That same Spirit that is shared by the Father and the Son. So my, my, my hope, my prayer for all of us is that we would be assured of the good news that we have a God who not only not only was one of us who became incarnate to be God with us, but who has gone to be with God now. Intercede for each and every one of you. A God who is present with all of you because Christ is present with us. We can listen to and address 
We know that because Christ, the one whom the disciples addressed, the one whom they followed and loved, is with the Father at the right hand of God. We'll actually enact this and, and, and live into it in a moment when we celebrate our Eucharist, where we say, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. That's pointing us to how we lift ourselves into heaven whenever we directly into God's presence and receive that presence through the signs, symbols, and sacraments of bread and wine. So be assured of that as you approach this altar, that you can approach God truly because Christ is at the right hand of the Father. And if it is Christ who is at the right hand of the Father, that is good news because that is in Christ we see that God is for us. He is for us and with us and with God and with God for you, for me, and for all of us. So let us go forth assured that Christ is absent in one way, but present to us in an ever more real way. Present to us at the Father's right hand. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the next thing we read. We believe in one God, Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all sins and humanities. We believe in one Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God from our Father, God from God. on you. Forgive you all your sins to our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. to see all of you today. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, if you are joining us, feel free to come to, to Brooks Hall after the service for coffee hour. We'd love a chance to connect and to get to know May 28th, which is next week. It's also the Feast of Pentecost. We will have an even song here in the church at 5 p.m.
caffeine Speaking of then, a real champ, uh, speaking of plans being changed, the organ did not work this morning, oh. which, is, but, but, which is why we have the piano. So thankful to have the organist of fire who uh, can adapt to uh, changes in plans. So hopefully the organ will be back up next week. If not, we'll bring out the heart support. Yeah. <laughs> um, on June 4th, we will have the uh, Highland Park in the neighborhood and uh, we'll have things for sale on the lawn um, so come out after church if you have things you'd like to donate uh, we are accepting donations um, until june 3rd for that as we'll have an announcement soon about a jazz on the lawn in july so keep that on your calendars well don't keep it on your calendars because i haven't told you the date yet so it's going to get you can put it on your calendars Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us and offered and sacrificed to God.
flooded with Christ, reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember our Bishop Kepton. Remember the Diocesan Cycle of Prayer, Christ Episcopal Church, Indiana, and the Reverend William Geiger, and the Reverend Mark Jacobson, missionary, and all who minister in your church. Remember all those celebrating birthdays this week, Janet Kilpatrick and Chris Katz. Remember Ivor. Remember our St. Andrew's Mission and Outreach and Service, East End and Walker and Bastards. Remember all who have died in the peace of